who is on this stage? And what has happened to the people on this stage? What happened to Women the Rouge? What happened to you? People like to talk about something they call the deep state. We don't mind that. But we know that it is neither a state nor is it deep. We know, those of us that have been involved from those early days of the 70s in some cases and later in other cases, that you're talking about an imperial force and it's an imperial force that terrifies a lot of people. But it mainly terrifies them because they refuse to submit themselves to rigorous thought in the service of bold action. That's all the problem is. The problem is not involved secret police and funny uh, microchips and weird drugs and subliminal messages and all those other things. It involves the inability to look into oneself and admit that the actions taken by people like Martin Luther King or the actions taken by people like Malcolm X or the actions taken by JFK are only characteristic of the actions that all of us must take in the context of what we have been confronted with ever since the 1960s, particularly coming out of the United States. It doesn't originate in the United States, but it will only be resolved if people in the United States decide to act. We're starting today with someone who's well known to most, and he and his associate who's with him, Kurt Wiebe, have been fighting for 20 years to tell a story. Uh, they told the story. They told the story 20 years ago. They've been fighting for 20 years to get other people to stand up. Uh, it's important to say that there is a faction of the American military and military intelligence which is patriotic. It's a faction that <coughs> intended to defend the United States. And it's a faction that also intended to make certain kinds of engineering and technical and even scientific breakthroughs on behalf of utilizing technology for positive purposes. William Binney, former intelligence official with the National Security Agency for over a 30-year period, attempted to do that and was prevented at a critical moment prior to September 11th of 2001 from doing his job. The United States paid for that. And you can't walk away from that crime. But talking about that from the standpoint of whether the planes were real or how the buildings came down or all these other things doesn't cut it. You have to confront something else. You have to confront what's happening to you right now Apart from your partisan beliefs, your political affiliations, you have to confront the fact that something is happening to all of us. And it's your responsibility <coughs> to listen to the people that can tell you what that is in such a fashion that you can then take the responsibility that many of us all want to take. Bill has spoken to several audiences, including the one here three years ago in mm -hmm. Symphony Space. And we're happy to have him here with us today. And so without further need to say anything, I'd like you to join me in welcoming William Denny, NSA whistleblower. Uh, yeah, as uh, uh, Dennis has said, uh, the government we had opted for bulk acquisition for two basic reasons, I think. One, one was set up by Cheney, Dick Cheney, and that was he wanted to know everything about all his potential adversaries, politically or otherwise. And so that many had to have information about everybody. And so the bulk acquisition satisfied his need in that respect. But in the other respect, uh, in the bureaucracies uh, of the government, bureaucrats tend to like to get bigger and bigger budgets and bigger and bigger uh, organizations. And so that meant more and more money and more and more influence. So in order to do that, 
if you opt for this bulk acquisition on everybody so that you can satisfy Cheney's needs, it also requires them, the Congress, to give you much more money so you can build your bureaucracy. And those are the basic, I think, motivations to do this. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> they had known also from the very beginning that there was another solution that would actually do productive things. Because when you took the bulk acquisition, that meant you couldn't see the threats coming. There was just too much data. That's why they haven't been able to prevent any of the terrorist attacks that have occurred anywhere in the world because all, everybody's adopted this policy and they can't see the threats coming. And this is documented internally in NSA records produced by Edward Snowden and also uh, MI5 and MI6 uh, records and some in GCHQ. They, they are saying, their analysts are set telling them, there's too much data, you've buried us, you've overloaded us, we can't see the threat coming. So. Just for that reason alone, they shouldn't be doing it. But uh, the, the 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 real point is the solution existed all along, and we were developing that in the thin thread program. It had basically three three tenets. Uh, one was a deductive approach, one an abductive approach, and one was a, a, a inductive approach. So uh, for the deductive approach, we simply looked at social organizations that stayed within a, uh, the one degree of the known bad guys and did a, uh, a, a serve and used that data to pull out information and only that information from the data flow that we were looking at. And we were looking at a uh, number of terabytes a minute so at the time. And we wanted to uh, up, up that to about 20 terabytes a minute. Uh, that was our approach and uh, that was the deductive side. So that, that was a human behavior property that showed probable cost. You're contacting a terrorist. And you need to be looked at. That's a fair thing. That's an easy to justify in a warrant. And, and in the inductive approach, we use simply you looking at sites that are advocating pedophilia or sites that advocate terrorism or violence against the West or bomb making and things like that. And you can try to watch people who visit those sites so that you see you can see the frequency of visit and say that they are probably getting radicalized or in the process of or you have people who have uh, cell phones in the mountains of Afghanistan or uh, in, uh, satellite phones in the mountains of Afghanistan or the jungles of Peru and you say, well, they're dope or they're terror potentials. So you look at that, those kinds of things. So that's kind of the inductive approach. So far, those two approaches would have caught every terrorist attack in the world before, during, and after 9-11. Everyone. <coughs> but did we do that? No, because, because that's a focused, disciplined, professional attack on the data against and, and against bad behavior by people indicating potential threats. Uh, and the abduct approach is a little more abstract. It says you look at geographical distribution. If you have a network that's uh, at one degree that is distributed on countries that uh, are involved in terrorist advocation or something like that, you need to look at them to see if they're, uh, they're terrorist or any way affiliated with a terrorist attack or a terrorist organization. Uh, and, and, uh, once you, and once you look at them, if they're not, then you uh, take them out and you simply say they're, they're out. And the rest of the data, you simply let go right by. And what that does is that gives everybody in the world privacy. And it, and it respects the constitutional rights and privacy rights of everybody in this country and every country in the world. Plus, it, it creates a, a, an extremely rich environment for analysts to succeed at preventing threats and, and uh, potential adversarial attacks. That's the, that's the whole point. That was the whole point of why we did the thin thread to begin with, because even back then, our, our analysts were buried with data. So the end result is that today we have a situation where the, the key point here is NSA database, uh, uh, databasing of information. Because our country is the only country in the world that can afford all the data storage that can store all the information they're collecting. I mean, they're collecting you know, multiple petabytes a day. So uh, in my estimate of the Utah storage facility alone was based on Cisco routers being put into it. And what they were estimating was uh, 966 exabytes of data going into that data center uh, a year uh, by 2015. So I figured they had to have at least five years worth of storage capacity, which meant five zettabytes, which is much less than a yottabyte, but still it's quite a bit. <laughs> and after that, we get a bunch of bytes and a lot of bytes. And all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, we, those it haven't been named above a yottabyte, but uh, so. Uh, but but the point is, NSA is the key element here. 
because it's a storage facility for not just the NSA, all of the agencies of the United States government, all the Five Eyes and all the uh, nine other countries that are participating with them in this worldwide collection of data and bulk acquisition on everybody on the planet. And all we would have to do is take our, our rule, deducted, inducted, ad record, take those rules and run it and process the entire database that's stored and pull out only that which is relevant and purge the rest of it. At that point, there would be no data available for anybody like in the U.S. government or the British government or anywhere to use against their people. So they couldn't be abused. So that would fix the problem. That meant mean the FBI, the DEA, and the DOJ, or anybody in the intelligence community or in the Five Eyes or any of the others could not go into that database and find information on any one citizen unless that citizen had probable cause, warrant-based uh, evidence that they should be there. And that's the way to fix this whole problem and do it rather quickly because once you retake that data out, no one has the ability to abuse it. Next, hear from Kirk Wiebe. I don't think a lot of people know much about Kirk. I'll just say the following, that he and Bill and another gentleman by the name of Ed Loomis developed what is called the Thin Thread System. This was referred to just a minute ago by Bill. And uh, I'm going to let Kirk tell you a little bit. He has a very specific view about the relationship between intelligence and the Constitution. Kirk? Yeah. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you to the LaRouche organization for making this possible and for uh, inviting us to address these fine people before us. Um, a lot of people don't realize it, but the, the National Security Agency, and I'm going to pick on them because I worked there for a long time with uh, Bill, um, has operated unconstitutionally for about 70% of the time it has existed on the planet. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the people in charge, namely the executive, namely the legislative branches of government, have formed a cabal, a cartel, if you will, that has decided to mass surveil the world, stuff the information in a database somewhere, big ones, and claim that they're not violating your rights under the Constitution. Because they say, yeah, we collected it, although they won't overtly admit it. But we haven't looked at it. And if we haven't looked it hasn't meant anything to an official in the government. Now, if we go back to the late 1700s, just before the outbreak of our famous Revolutionary War, King George of England, uh, it's documented, wanted to put a red coat, a British soldier, in the home of every colonial settler in the United States. And why do you think he wanted to do that? You know the answer. He wanted to know what they were thinking and doing. Let me suggest to you that with all the electronic devices, you know, if I asked any one of you, how many electronic devices connected to the internet does your family have? I know it's more than one. Probably four. What do you think? More? I agree. The point is this. Each of those are sources of information about you and those who you love the most. Every detail, every thought that's communicated via those devices can be collected and put in a database. And when someone decides you're important, for some reason, it could be anything. Somebody wants to blackmail you. 
somebody wants to scam you. You know, the only difference between a good person and a bad person in government is what? What is it? Yeah, really, it's opportunity. And do you have what we would call moral clarity? But beyond that, do you have a sense of what's right and wrong in this nation? the founding document of which is the United States Constitution, and do you care? Well, I would submit to you, we have in the news events going on, namely the attack using the weaponized sources of the intelligence community to subvert a duly elected president. If that's not a warning, what do, they, what do you think they could do to one of you? or three of you, or Bill and me, or anyone else. So the threat is real, it has been abused, and it lies at the feet of people who are greedy for power. It didn't start out that way, it started out nobly, but now we've reached a point where people have decided they know better, they know best how to manage all of our lives. And it's not just an essay anymore. Google knows what you're doing, Facebook knows what you're doing, Instagram knows what you're doing. We are being, you know, it's, pro it's proliferating everywhere, and now we have the Internet of Things where even your refrigerator can talk to the Internet. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Your whole lives are stuck in a database. So the point of it is, Bill has suggested that there's a way to put the genie back in the box, but it's going to be you who makes it happen. Don't expect some senator, don't expect some congressman, with the exception of Chief of CIA Pompeo inviting Bill to talk about the DNC Data Act. Uh, no member of government has ever approached him or me and said, would you come talk to a few congressmen about What's happened? Your ideas for fixing it? No. Why? They like it the way it is. Your data is available to anyone in 16 agencies within the intelligent and law, law enforcement communities. That's the threat, and only we can change it. Thank you. now from Mike Billington. And Mike is going to tell you a bit about himself. He is, as is listed here in your little program, Executive Intelligence Review Asia Editor. He's author of a book called Reflections of an American Political Prisoner. Mike uh, was offered, I'd rather I say it than he has to say it, after two trials, one trial in which he said two or three years, was offered a plea bargain which would have meant that he would have simply served time, the time served, no time would have been additional. And all he had to do was claim to be guilty of something of which he was not. A lot of his friends would have had a big problem. And Mike decided, you know what, I don't think I'm going to do that. Uh, despite the fact that his own attorney asked to be replaced, despite the fact that Mike said he would replace him. The judge in the case refused to do that, and Mike was given a 77-year sentence. He served eight years of it. Is that the price you have to pay for integrity in this country? Now, if it is, I will submit to all of you, as you listen to him, you think about whether or not that's the kind of country you want to live in. Mike Billington. Let's start by looking at the fact that just last week, uh, Donald Trump uh, pardoned or commuted the sentence of 11 people. Some of them were people who, like myself and my co-defendants, were innocent. 
and were uh, illegally and, uh, and unjustly charged and tried and, and sent to prison. Others did commit crimes, but they were subjected to outrageous sentences uh, in order to not just to silence them, but to terrorize other people. Uh, the fact that Trump did this, and that he also addressed quite publicly and at some length the issue of Roger Stone, uh, and the fact that, it, as he said, he will probably be exonerated one way or another, means that this is very, very much on Donald Trump's mind. Uh, and I will mention that Roger Stone, who is someone who has quite publicly addressed Lyndon LaRouche as one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, has interviewed him, has spoken at our conferences, is very well known to the uh, criminal network within the criminal justice system who have run the entire operation against Trump, against uh, Roger Stone and others. And I'll come back to that. The, um, one of the people uh, released by, by Donald Trump was Ron Blagojevich, who paper I do not have. Excuse Somehow I don't have what I wanted to read to you. I will convey in, in brief some of what he said the day he came out where he and his wife and his two daughters met outside the house and he addressed the fact, first of all, that there was no way to thank President Trump for freeing a man from a charge which uh, he had not committed. There was no way to, to thank him. Uh, he said that Trump is a very firm leader, a very tough leader, but also has a huge heart, and that releasing Blagojevich was an act of <coughs> kindness which people had to recognize. Uh, he then went on to say uh, that uh, what had, that he had not, to the people of Illinois who had elected him twice as governor, he said, I did not let you down. I would have let you down had I given in to this, if I had admitted guilt to something I didn't do, if I had gone along in order to save myself this 14-year sentence, of which he served eight years. Uh, and he then quoted from a Supreme Court justice, uh, Justice Breyer, uh, who said that the idea that people in, in politics and the political world could be charged criminally for what they're supposed to do as politicians is one of the greatest threats to America today. This is a Supreme Court justice. And that in particular, he said, prosecutors armed with this, with this potential is a grave danger to our system of government. And Blagojevich said he, had, he learned that the hard way, as many of us did. But I think it's extremely important that you have people at that level directly addressing the uh, broken criminal justice system that existed, he has specifically said, since 1994 when this Crime Act was passed, which was a disaster, which he described as a, as a racist and illegal uh, act. The Linda LaRouche, long before that, was convicted uh, and served uh, five years of a 15-year sentence. From, from, 19, from 1990 to 1995. Uh, he could have been exonerated by President Clinton. Clinton was considering it. Literally tens of thousands of leading uh, citizens of this nation and from around the world wrote to Clinton calling for him to pardon and exonerate LaRouche. But he didn't. Uh, he did make sure that LaRouche was released after the, the first uh, pardon potential, not pardon, uh, parole potential after five years. So he served five years of that 15-year sentence. When he was released, uh, he organized here in Virginia a forum before a, a, a panel of very distinguished jurists and political leaders and others. Uh, testimony on the LaRouche case and on other cases of, of the misuse of the criminal justice system. Uh, in particular, the Furmension case, which was the uh, official FBI doctrine that any black elected official was, by the fact of being black, more prone to corruption and therefore legitimate to be investigated. Uh, in that hearing, um, I want to read what, some of what Lynn said himself in that testimony. He said, we have, in my view, a system, and this is long before 
the 1990s and 9-11. This is back in, in, the, in the 1980s. We have, in my view, a system of injustice whose center within the Department of Justice, especially the criminal division of the U.S. Department of Justice. The problem lies not with one administration or another, though one administration or another may act more positively or more negatively, but it's the permanent civil service employees who are coordinators of a nest of institutions in the criminal division which show up repeatedly as leading or key associates of every legal atrocity which I have seen. In my case, when the time came that somebody wanted me out of the way, they were able to rely upon that permanent injustice in the permanent bureaucracy of government to do the job. Always there's that agency inside the Justice Department which works for a contract, like a hitman. When somebody with the right credentials and passwords walks in and says, we want to get this group of people, or we want to get this person. And until we remove from our system of government the rotten permanent bureaucracy which acts like contract assassins using the authority of the justice system to perpetrate assassination, this country is not free, nor anyone in it. Odin Anderson, uh, Lynn's lawyer, then presented a series of documents which we'd obtained through Freedom of Information from the FBI, and I'll just briefly mention. It included uh, the uh, idea of putting out false leaflets under the, the LaRouche organization's name going back into the 1960s and 70s. It included Henry Kissinger's letter to the head of the FBI saying, can't you get this guy? He's being very obnoxious. Uh, a letter from the director of the FBI to some of his subordinates saying, let's investigate him under, as a, if we don't know where his money comes from, uh, let's investigate him as being funded by a foreign hostile force, which then uh, calls into being uh, Executive Order 12333, which basically says somebody financed by a foreign hostile force, you can throw the Constitution out and do whatever you want, uh, and others of this sort. Uh, so this, this was well documented. And then, <clears throat> then Ramsey Clark spoke. And Ramsey Clark, I'm sure most of you know, was the Attorney General of the United States <coughs> under uh, President Johnson. And he became our lawyer for the appeal when we were first convicted in the federal case. Uh, and here's what he said, first of all, in a letter that he wrote to Janet Reno, then the Attorney General, same position he had held. He says, this case, the LaRouche case, believes, I believe, involves a broader range of deliberate and systemic misconduct and abuse of power over a longer period of time in an effort to destroy a political movement and leader than any other federal prosecution in my time or to my knowledge. A tragic miscarriage of justice. In the testimony of the same hearings that Mr. LaRue spoke in, he said, uh, what was a complex and pervasive utilization of law enforcement, prosecution, media, and non-governmental organizations, those NGOs, those no-good organizations, uh, focused on destroying an enemy. This case must be number one. Uh, the purpose can only be seen as destroying more than a political movement, more than a political figure. It is those two but it's a fertile engine of ideas and a common purpose of thinking and studying and analyzing to solve problems regardless of the impact on the status quo or on vested interests. It was the deliberate purpose to destroy that at any cost. So this is what the LaRouche case was and was recognized increasingly by many people. That's why they had to destroy him and try to poison his name in the media to prevent these ideas from being placed at the accessibility of the American and world population. Now, clearly, it's exactly this same network that uh, went after Donald Trump. I don't think I have to explain that. It's pretty obvious. In terms of my own case, I think to get at that, I want to say something else about Roger Stone. Um, you probably all watched The Raid the great raid on Roger Stone's house. <clears throat> a 66-year-old man with no criminal record attacked at, what, 5 in the morning or something like that, with, of course, CNN standing out there. Everybody watched this horrible criminal being put in handcuffs and dragged off. 
Well, I'm very familiar with that scene. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, on, on October 6th, 1986, the day of what we called the Big Panty Raid in Leesburg, uh, armed forces from many different uh, law enforcement uh, agencies uh, raided our offices, surrounded Linda LaRouche's house, and when my wife got up that morning and was taking the, uh, the garbage down to the end of our lane, she saw a whole slew of armed men in police cars and CNN ready to come in for some reason, not coming in immediately. So we called our neighbors, John and, and Renee Segerson, who happened to live near us at that time, and said, why don't you come over while we wait until they come in and arrest me? And so we were sitting there watching the Marriage of Figaro, I think, on the video. <laughs> when these men finally decided to come running up the road with their guns drawn and surrounded the house and pulled me out and put me in chains and took me off and so forth. Why? And CNN, my wife came out and said, get the hell off my yard, you have no right to be here. So <laughs> that was, so this, this is, this is uh, something that was going on then and is going on now. Uh, in my case, there was something of this deep state, so-called, directly involved. Um, a, a fellow named Oliver North, some of you probably remember, who was at that time running through the so-called Iran-Contra operation, a scam where we were arming terrorists in Nicaragua. Uh, and the planes unloading the guns that were being shipped down to them, uh, just as we were shipping weapons to Al-Qaeda in Libya and so forth. Um, we're coming back loaded up with cocaine. We exposed that, that this was a drug running operation, and that Oliver North, a good friend of Henry Kissinger and others, uh, was running this scam. Uh, and then I, I, we found out that, uh, that Ollie North was also running around raising huge amounts of money, stealing really, huge amounts of money from people, telling them that this was to fight communism, it was to save America, and so forth, when in fact it was financing arms running and, and drug running. And one of the people they scammed was somebody who was a major contributor to us and with, in whom I was in regular contact. <coughs> Oliver Nerth told her that you have bad people who are trying to undermine you're doing good things, uh, therefore you should let me tap your phone, which was done. And they monitored our calls. Uh, this was not just to get me, but it was to be fully on top of exactly what we were doing as an organization at that time. So um, I think that's the reason I was hit particularly hard with the indictments. I was indicted both in the federal case and in the Virginia state case. Uh, the railroad, as we called it, went forth. We were all convicted. I won't go through the ugly details, but it's worth reading. Uh, and I got three years in the, in the federal case, and then, as, as Dennis explained, I was told in the state case where I was charged with crimes that could have been 90 years, uh, that I simply had to lie, and I could go home. Uh, so that didn't happen, and as a result, I got a 77-year sentence. Many of the people I met in prison when I said I had a 77-year sentence said, how many bodies do you got? <laughs> so so I, I did not. Uh, and I want to read something that Dennis actually read at a previous event and which really struck me from Martin Luther King. He said, you may be 38 years old, as I happen to be, and one day some great opportunity stands before you and calls you to stand up for some great principle some great issue, some great cause, and you refuse to do it because you're afraid. You refuse to do it because you want to live longer. You're afraid that you'll lose your job, you're afraid you will be criticized or that you'll lose your popularity. Or you're afraid that somebody will stab you or shoot you or bomb your house. And so you refuse to take the stand. Well, you may go on and live until you're 90 but you're just as dead at 38 as you would be at 90. And the cessation of breathing in your life is but the belated announcement of an earlier death of spirit. And I can assure you that my life is a proof of that fact, because I did have to spend a total of 10 years in prison. Uh, but I can honestly say these were the best years of my life. Uh, Probably with my fellow inmates was my 
by trying to convince them that this was the only chance they had in life where they didn't have to work, they didn't have to support a family, they should learn, they should read, they should not waste away feeling sorry for themselves. But I was given, really, the assignment of China. I mean, 77 years, you know, you've got 5,000 years of history to study, you need 77 years to take that on. But it became a real passion. Uh, it was something we needed to do. Uh, my co-defendant, Will Wirtz, was at the time translating Nicholas of Cusa, who was the relatively unknown great uh, mind uh, of, the of the European Renaissance era. Uh, and I was then reading Confucius and Mencius and another relatively unknown but magnificent figure called Zhu Xi during the Song Dynasty in the 12th century and saw the comparison between what I was reading of Kuza and what I was reading of these Chinese and was able to pull together a sense of the way in which the great Christian Renaissance of Europe and the Confucian Renaissance where Zhu Xi, like, uh, like Kuza, was restoring the Platonic tradition and the Confucian tradition, which had been lost over the Dark Ages in both Europe and, and China. So this was a, uh, it was a profound uh, chance for me to really make great discoveries, which enriched my life and, and, I, and through my work hopefully enriched the world and made uh, those who put me in prison very sorry that they'd given me the opportunity <coughs> to do that. Uh, and then lastly, I'll say that there was a, a one particularly um, profound experience. At, at one point, another of my co-defendants, um, Paul Gallagher, uh, and I were in the same, <coughs> same, same prison. <coughs> and we formed a classical course. <coughs> so we had a course of people, of criminals, some fairly serious criminals, child molesters, murderers, um, but people who, with one exception, had never participated in any kind of classical music, totally unfamiliar with classical music, had never tried to sing. But we had been trained in some bel canto methods, uh, and we began to train them. And we sang Bach, and we sang Schubert, and we sang some Negro spirituals. And in particular, we sang Beethoven. Now, this is the year of Beethoven. Our theme is to think like Beethoven. Many of you may have seen Helga Zepp-LaRouche two weeks ago gave a forum here in New York <coughs> from Germany on Fidelio, the great opera by, by Beethoven, in which uh, the, uh, the lady, Leonora, uh, dresses as a boy, Fidelio, uh, and goes and to work for the warden of a prison where she believes her husband is being held illegally and secretly by a tyrant. And through this story, she eventually frees her husband. And this a very powerful story. And you can imagine why Helga loves this story uh, with uh, Lynn having been in prison this time. And I had a similar experience. My late wife at that time <coughs> traveled the world meeting with uh, presidents and world courts and so forth, addressing this injustice to Lyndon LaRouche. So in one scene in this great opera is called The Prisoner's Chorus. This is where Leonora Fidelio succeeds in getting the warden to let the prisoners out for just a moment uh, to get some fresh air. And they come out and sing this male chorus uh, called uh, um, O Belge Lust, O What Joy, to breathe the fresh air again. And they think about freedom, 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 Freiheit, Freiheit. But then they remember that they're being watched and they sort of skulk back into their cells. Well, we, we sang this at, at the prison, and it had that in particular, the whole thing, but that in particular, that Beethoven principle, had a profound effect in every one of those people. <clears throat> and I've told this story before, and I didn't choke up when I said it, but every one of them, at some point afterwards, came up to me to um, try to express that they had never known of this kind of beauty in the world. Uh, and let, <coughs> excuse me, let alone that they could participate in the creation of that kind of beauty. So, <coughs> so when Lyndon LaRouche uh, launched the Manhattan Project here in New York <coughs> with the intention of creating a vast chorus that would sing both the classical repertoire and the Negro spirituals because these were not just popular music or, or gospels, these were songs that were about the fight for freedom 
and had a classical nature in that sense. I understood exactly what he meant. That this was the way in which we can build the necessary movement for, <coughs> for a true renaissance. So the Schiller Institute's <coughs> The Schiller Institute's motto has always been the Schiller motto, that the path to truth is through beauty. Uh, and the, the, this is an example of why building this course, there was a, there was a music event last night, and I understand that those people who went and, and participated in the music, who were being recruited to our political ideas, but it's through participating in this kind of great culture which we've lost in America, with the ugliness that outpasses for culture. That this is the way we create the potential to reverse the decay and the, the collapse of the civilization that we're living in, and actually creating the new paradigm that Helga addressed. So, <clears throat> um, I think uh, this is why, if we make this possible, that LaRouche is exonerated by a President Donald Trump who wants to achieve what he says, in terms of bringing the world together around these powerful ideas of development of science, of cooperation, and great culture, that all of these ideas of this brilliant man, these beautiful ideas, will be made available to everyone, which has been denied them for these last 40 or 50 years, uh, which is the great crime of the persecution of the LaRouche, that these ideas were prevented from being known and, and uh, uplifting the population. So this is where we stand. <laughs> and I think this is why we have this kind of a fight to expose and destroy, whether you call it deep state or British intelligence, destroy those who have, have purposely set out to destroy both the culture as well as the economy and the uh, participation of our citizens in this kind of commitment to what in fact can and must be a new paradigm. Thank you. You have a moment of tension. Don't let the tension go by. Because you have to ask yourself a question. How does somebody like that spend 10 years in jail? And you and I don't do anything about it. It's not a question of guilt. Because the issue is how many other people is that happening to? How many people without movements? How many people that don't have the words? How many of the people who just are trying to live their lives and because of surveillance and because of ambition, greed, or who knows what, they are suddenly swept up in a process which is not personal, but it's a collapse of a civilization. And it victimizes us all. Unless, unless, we take the ideas that you've heard and fight back. Now what I'm going to do is, uh, I think we have a, some microphones, uh, I believe, and uh, I'm going to take a question from the audience, but I'm going to take one which was texted, because this was re ref uh, to, to Bill, and it may probably help get some other things going. So Bill, I'm going to, I got a question for you. This is about, uh, well, it's really about Russia again. The specific question is, can you address the reliance on CrowdStrike? Why is the intelligence community relying on CrowdStrike? I think you should explain to people what that is so they know, and then just do your uh, Well, I was telling Michael here that uh, basically they tried to do the same thing to us, put us in jail under uh, under the espionage law, the 1917 espionage law, they were threatening to indict us on that. Uh, and uh, the only reason they didn't was because I had uh, assembled evidence of malicious prosecution on the part of the Department of Justice. And so I, I threatened them with that and publicly, uh, or over the phone, read to uh, Tom Drake, whom I knew his phone was tapped by the FBI, so I was really talking to the FBI. Sorry. And uh, I was reading all the evidence I had about malicious prosecution, so I, and I told Tom, because they were going to indict us. So I told him, I said, when they indict us, uh, tell your lawyer we're going to charge them with malicious prosecution when they take us to court. And then I hung up. And that's the only reason that we were in jail, like you. 
That was the point I was trying to make. That's, that was the connection that I had with well, the other, we all had. The other, thing I'd like you to do, <laughs> the other thing I'd like you to do is to say a bit, because you guys both got rated by yeah. FBI. Yeah. Just let people know that they are aware of that. Yeah, we, uh, we uh, also, uh, uh, Kirk Leaving, uh, uh, Diane Work, and uh, Ed Loomis and I signed a uh, uh, DOD IG complaint against the uh, NSA for corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse. And we're required to do that, by the way, by regulation. And so when we did that, uh, that was in uh, September of 2002, they sent a team of inspectors out, about 12 of them, to investigate uh, the uh, NSA. And it took them two and a half years, and a part of that process, NSA tried to subvert their investigation, and they found out about it, of course, and they, they came back on them for that. But that, so there was only more, more corruption, uh, evidence of corruption there. And so they found out everything we had said was true. Everything, you know. And, uh, and so uh, that was sitting there, and that caused NSA a lot of problems. Uh, in fact, at the time, the report that the DOD issued in 2005 was suppressed. It wasn't distributed like normal reports would be because it was too damning to NSA. Because it exposed so, many, so much of the corruption and fraud. Uh, wasting of tens of billions of dollars, and so uh, that was uh, uh, <clears throat> that was the the part that left them with a very bad taste and a vendetta to get us somehow. So in 2007, after the New York Times article about the uh, warrantless wiretapping program, which is only a minuscule part of what they were really doing, uh, uh, they 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 thought the D well actually the DOD IG. Inspector General himself gave our names as potential uh, leakers to the New York Times for that article. Of course, we weren't, and uh, they knew that, of course, because they had all our phone calls, emails, and everything, because they collected it with the bulk acquisition at the time, and we knew that too. So, uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> they uh, they uh, still trumped up this charge of this basic. Uh, they said we had some other agency's sensitive data, and they raided us, all four of us. The ones who only the, those of us who signed the uh, the complaint against the NSA. So that we got raided on the 26th of July of 2007. Very similar to Roger Stone, with only about half as many agents, but in, in guns drawn in my case. And uh, so uh, that that uh, they everybody else seemed to get a little uh, disturbed and taken aback by the thing. And all, all I was doing was at the time getting rather angry at them for being there. So I started accusing them of things like, uh, you were sent here by somebody outside the FBI, right? And uh, of course, the, it's like kids getting their, caught with their hand in a cookie jar. You know, you could see their physical body reaction that says that was absolutely right. And the guy who did it was uh, uh, Gonzalez, I'm sure, the Attorney General at the time, because he, he, uh, this was the morning of the second day after his testimony to the Senate Judiciary Committee giving explaining the uh, terrorist surveillance program, for which he only talked about the minuscule part, you know, the warrantless wiretap that was exposed by the president. Well, we, we knew all the rest of it, and, and uh, we also had a, had a propensity to go to committees in Congress and tell them the truth, uh, which, of course, the administration didn't. So uh, <clears throat> they, they wanted to silence us, not keep us off balance, and so on. That's why they did the raid. So. But at any rate, uh, the whole thing came out in the end. Uh, they, they, they ran away after we exposed the, all their malicious attempts at prosecution, and we haven't heard from them since. Kirk, I'd like you to do one thing here, which is to explain to people what it is that in your Thin Thread program became uh, so threatening. That is to say, you guys figured out how to do things very efficiently, and go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> You know, uh, a number of years had passed, and uh, I would find myself thinking, what nation would attack the very people developing the most advanced capabilities within the lawful guidelines of the Constitution? To find bad people to prevent attacks, to prevent crime, whatever it may be. Why? It was anathema to me. I, I couldn't figure it out. And I wasn't street smart enough to realize that evil exists in the highest levels of government. You, you don't want to admit that. You want to have faith 
in your government. And it was a shocking reality that hit me upside the head and said, my God, it is that simple. Evil wants to control the outcome. So my belief is that ultimately it was their fear of us providing capabilities that if they were in the hands of a number of people searching through data uh, scooped up by the NSA and others, that we would see things being done by the, by the very perpetrators within government that were unconstitutional and evil. And it's for that reason that they erased literally all the hard drives of the capabilities that we had developed. That shocking reality. One other thing, while you have the microphone, and then what we'll do, everybody, is we'll take a break after this for 10 minutes so everybody can get your questions ready, and then we'll just go at it. Uh, explain what happened with the individual that came to see you guys. His name is Black. Was that his name? Yeah. Oh yeah, this is very interesting and very telling. <clears throat> I remember when Bill was there, the deputy director of NSA, who was the man most influential in getting this guy promoted to the senior ranks of technical director at NSA, said, I want to come down and see what you've developed. And we were joyous about that. Here's the deputy director. We've been fighting to get clarity and understanding and sharing what uh, successes we had had. Here's the second man in charge coming down, and he did. And we sat around the table and showed him, and he said this, and I quote, my God, you have made major breakthroughs. Why are you being so modest? We weren't being modest, but the levels in between us in a lab atmosphere and all the layers of bureaucracy up to him weren't letting the word get out because they wanted dollars. They wanted to win. There was a, a, what I would call an unhealthy competitiveness amongst organizations within the government. And so it was really bad in terms of a great outcome for the American people. And, and uh, so we were very excited by his comments. It certainly meant for us that he would go back up to the ninth floor of NSA and share what he had seen with the director, none other than uh, Lieutenant General Michael V. Hayden, United States Air Force. We never heard from the ninth floor again. Not again. It was clear, and we saw this reinforced later, that Hayden had told Bill Black to shut up. Because it was his agenda that he wanted Congress to hear, not what was going down in terms of our success story. There were holes in the time sequence in the, by July, and all those were filled by the data from 1 September. So that says he made one download, split it into two files, did a range change on the date and a range change on the hour, and that's all he had to do. He couldn't do a range change in a minute because it crossed minutes, or multiple minutes. He couldn't certainly do it on seconds. It would be impossible to do that. You have to handle every second, you know. There's too many changes. So, but he could do the hour and the, and the date change, and the, with a range change. But then there was another part of it, too, that uh, came out a little bit later more recently, and that's the, the, the guys in the UK found uh, five items from Gooster 2's post in the 15th of June, the early June, where he put it out there and said the Russians did the hack because here's, the, here's, uh, here's all the signatures with Russian fingerprints on it, some Cyrillic and things like that, anything that a real uh, spy would never do. But, uh, but I mean, uh, here it is, this, this is evidence that the Russians did it. So, we, he, we, the five items that he found, that our guys found uh, from that posting that he made on the 15th of June of 2016, they were also posted by WikiLeaks in the Podesta emails. 
So the same five items are in both places, except in the Podesta emails posted by WikiLeaks, there are no Russian signatures. So that meant, very simply put, Gusper II inserted those signatures into those files to claim that the Russians did the hack. So uh, that, that, meant, that meant, very simply, that Gusper II was an entire fake, and that he was modifying those files, and, and uh, then when you looked at the uh, Vault 7 uh, releases from, uh, posted by WikiLeaks, it uh, gave a program called Marvel Framework, which is one of the attack uh, programs that the uh, CIA would be using, one of tens of thousands of them they had, so in that, uh, in, in that release. And that, that program can do an attack on somebody and make it look like other countries did it. Well, the ones they had that, that they could modify to do it at the time were Russia, China, uh, North Korea, Iran, and Arab countries. <laughs> so that, that, that then, uh, along with the, in the Marvel framework, it said that, 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 that the, this program was used once in 2016. Well, it was probably done on 15th of June of 2016 by Gusser II, who was a member of CIA, <laughs> internally, in this group in CIA, that's involved in the creation of Gusser II and the fabrication of the Russian hack. Uh, this is, these are the same people, and in fact, we, uh, from another uh, whistleblower who's coming out, we may or may not hear more about this later, later on, and hopefully we do. Uh, he is claiming that he set up a program called the Hammer, Run, uh, Run for Clapper, and Brennan. And that, that program was set up to do spy on Trump and the other people of importance that they viewed that were threats. And this was done separate from everything else in the government, so that all run by a small group within CIA. So that meant that uh, <clears throat> here is a separate, and the reason they had to do it separately, see if they wanted to spy on, on the President uh, Trump's campaign, or even before the campaign, they'd have to go into the NSA data to do it. And once they did that, there would be a trail record of what they did in the network's logs or in any kind of uh, data request they would make, those, those things would be recorded and traceable back to them. But when they do it separately with this separate program, a hammer, using, the same, using some of the software we developed again, uh, because it effectively could uh, download the uh, entire internet. So uh, <clears throat> in order to use that, to do that, and, and uh, do it separately with this group so that there was no traceability anywhere in government. Even DOJ couldn't trace what they did. That was what they were, that's the reason what, what they've done and what they tried to do. And this is why all this Russiagate stuff is a fabrication of CIA and various other participants in the deep state.